This is Crosscut Reports. I'm Sarah Bernard. Today, we turn to Afghanistan and take a look at the effect the new Taliban regime has had on women and girls. Taliban's intentional and calculated policy is to repudiate the human rights of women and girls. Freelance journalist Hal Burnton brings us a story about a Washington woman and the Kabul-based nonprofit organization she runs. Marnie Gustafson, who spent part of her childhood in Kabul, has led the aid group Parsa for 16 years. In that time, she's helped run schools and improve orphanages, train teachers and social workers. Now, even as the Taliban has sought to remove girls and women from public life by imposing severe restrictions on them, she's continued this work, helping launch new efforts to run classrooms out of people's homes. In this conversation, Hal also discusses his own experience reporting in Afghanistan and why now is not the time, for him anyway, to forget these stories or America's promises to the Afghan people. So, Hal, I understand that you met Marnie Gustafson in Afghanistan in 2009. Um, But first off, I was curious, what were you doing in Afghanistan then? Well, in 2009, I was doing a lot of military reporting for the Seattle Times. It was post-911, and a whole brigade from Joint Base Lewis-McChord with uh, striker armor vehicles was heading over to Afghanistan. They had been there. They had just arrived. And we worked out uh, a plan for me to spend nine weeks in Afghanistan, partly to embed with the military troops, but partly to be based out of Kabul and report uh, for uh, our partner, McClatchy News, about everything that was going on around the capital and maybe a few trips elsewhere. We have a clear and focused goal, to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat al-Qaeda in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and to prevent their return to either country in the future. Wow. Yeah. So so very, very much reporting on the war. Yes. And I must say that when I met Marnie, it was this just amazing moment where I had been in the staying in very heavily fortified hostel. There had been bomb blasts around Kabul, a lot of tensions around an election. And arriving at the compound where Parsa is based, which is within a campus of the Afghan Red Crescent, it was just kind of relaxing. There was home-baked pizza and talk of Seattle, and it was just like, where am I? And who is this person? Wow. And how did you, how did you meet Marnie? How did you sort of end up at her, her home there in Afghanistan? Well, you know, I was blogging back then, and it was all being published back in Puget Sound. I think someone said, you've got to visit Marnie. Huh. <laughs> and so one evening, I, I did. I, I took a cab. It was a long drive to sort of the outskirts of town and and visited. And it was kind of an unforgettable evening. So uh, three years later, when I returned to Afghanistan, I actually stayed at Parsa, got to know her better, got to know more what she was doing, and wrote a, a deeper profile of her work. 2012 was when I visited so the original sort of connection to Marnie was through the the Seattle area connection. It was like somebody who knew of her because she had a a Seattle area connection as well. Yeah, I mean she has deep roots in the region. She her family's uh, Port Orchard homestead. She calls it the Shire. Uh, this property was settled by her great grandfather Fred Harper, and uh, he was drawn to that area apparently by the opportunity to forge. Uh, bricks from the clay in the area. Her father taught school in the Seattle area, and then she spent a lot of her earlier life in Seattle area working under contract for social services with the state. So when you first met her, I mean, what struck you about her? I mean, was it her her person, her, her style, or her work, or everything? So many of the diplomats, you know, this was a time when 
armored vehicles were everywhere if you were seeing people travel. And uh, there was a lot of fortifications, millions and millions of dollars of aid from the U.S. pouring in, just big-scale projects. And Marnie was sort of uh, just very different from all that. Uh, It was a much more relaxed atmosphere. She was quite critical of a lot of what the aid programs, how they were being conducted. And she had a very sort of contrarian view and also obviously a lot of experience in Afghanistan. And so after spending time covering the elections and talking to a lot of folks within the embassy and stuff, it was just a very different view of the world. And of course, here she was from Washington State. And when you met her in 2009 and went back in 2012, how would you characterize, you know, the kind of work that Parso was doing at the time? What was the the kind of focus? Well, at that point, one of the focuses was on orphanages. They were trying to improve orphanages. And there had been some real scandals. Parsa had documented how orphanage supplies were stolen by underpaid staff. And then security guards at one facility had arranged for boys to leave at night uh, to dance for men in parties that ended in sexual abuse. And uh, Parsa staffer even secured a, a video at one of these parties and an orphanage director lost his job. And so they were doing a lot. They were also really involved in reviving the Afghan scout movement for both boys and girls, um, which had dated back decades. And uh, she was working to rebuild scouting networks as a leadership tool for children and teenagers. You know, it seems like what I can glean from your reporting is that the work itself has adapted in some ways over the years, you know, had, has retained some focus, but also adapted in some ways over the years to various needs of the Afghan people, but perhaps also the shifting regimes and, and regulations. And now the Taliban's treatment of women and girls is again a central issue. Your most recent reporting that you did for Crosscut, it focused a lot on the most recent news to come out of the current Taliban regime. The Taliban moved to block women from universities, effectively banning women and girls from middle school through college. Decrees involving women and girls and their access to public life. What happened most recently in terms of the impact that it had on Marnie and her work and her colleagues? Marnie, after the fall of the U.S.-backed government, did evacuate, which was on one of the last scheduled flights out of Kabul. She did spend some restless months back in Washington, and then she returned. And her goal was to try to figure out how to make Parsa relevant in this new era with the collapse of the old government and the rise of the Taliban. Now, she, like many leaders of international organizations, had had dealings with the Taliban in the past because there were areas of Afghanistan that were have long been under Taliban control. In order to operate, you need to at least reach out and talk with the Taliban. So that wasn't entirely new terrain for her. There was some immediate work with just providing food boxes and things like that to people. And then, really this year, she and Parsa, uh, began to organize a network of homeschools in Kabul, but also in provinces uh, around Afghanistan to allow both teenage girls or secondary school girls who are no longer uh, permitted at this point to attend public schools, but also other family members to continue to learn. And the figure as of last month was that they were working in 17 of Afghanistan's 34 provinces, and there were 170 homeschools serving more than 2,000 students. Wow. 
um, you've reported that they had some programs in place that were thrown into a kind of jeopardy sort of suddenly, not only because they involved girls' education, but also because there was a, an order that came down that prevented women from going to work in an aid organization, for example. This weekend, the Taliban ordered that women can no longer work for any non-governmental organizations, including relief agencies. And so there, it sounded like a kind of last-minute scramble to figure out a way to continue employing women as well, right? Yeah, there was really some bad news that came through in December where there was a prohibition on women going to work in aid organizations and Parsa had some 30 women employed at a Kabul office. They had to be sent home and this on-site leadership training, Sisters for Sisters, involving some 60 teenage girls. So they had to Right away, uh, uh, the decision was made that to comply with this rule, and these women and girls, teenage girls, couldn't come to Parse anymore. But that's when a new plan was sort of forged that would allow them to keep working from their homes to help organize these homeschools. Wow. I mean, it's, yeah, remarkably resilient, and also it strikes me as probably kind of scary for everyone because it's it's perhaps operating in kind of a gray area? Well, I think that the feeling is that they are complying with the rules in the sense that the women aren't going to, the girls are not going to public schools. Uh, they are staying at home. And there's been a real effort to try to find ways to work with the Taliban and continue to do things, but it is, it is an uneasy time understanding what is possible and what is not possible. And there, there's a bit of history here that I think is worth noting. During the two decade long war in Afghanistan, the, the US government poured more than $1.1 billion into the nation to improve education and get more girls into the classroom. Um, this was a really a key policy goal during the Obama administration. It was championed by then U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and she even vowed that no peace deal with the Taliban would trample on women's rights. Women must be included and women's rights respected as part of any peace negotiation in Afghanistan. And uh, girls' education did make big gains, but it was always a very uneven success story in a lot of the provinces, particularly those that were more conservative and traditional and Taliban strongholds. Many, many girls continued to be held out of school, particularly secondary school. And so as early as 2006, the U.S. Agency for International Development looked at developing alternative methods of community-based schools in homes or other locations outside of traditional classrooms. And it's interesting that when I reached out to USAID for this story, they said they continued to stay engaged in education in Afghanistan. Now, I want to say right off that Parsa does not receive money from USAID. They don't disclose who they give all their money to, but Parsa is not part of that pipeline. So... There is a long history of the effort from the U.S. to get more women, more girls into school, and also a recognition early on that the public school traditional format wasn't always going to be the right fit everywhere. You were able to speak with a couple of students and teachers for this story who, who worked with Parsa on some of these programs, some of these homeschools, and just, you know, speaking of these tensions and this sort of uncertainty, and I was just curious how those conversations went for you. I mean, wh were the people you spoke with, were they uncomfortable at all speaking with a journalist? I was just wondering if that was difficult. They were remarkably sort of proud of what they were doing and and eager to talk. And 
of course, it was a somewhat limited because I spoke just with several who spoke remarkably good English. I don't want to downplay the seriousness of the situation. Just in talking to these teenagers, they were optimistic and proud of what they were doing. There was one moment that I thought was very interesting. When the Sisters for Sisters program, when they had to terminate it because of the decree back in December, they said, well, it's not fair if they can't come, why should the boys come? And uh, so the boys in their training was also terminated. And then uh, Marnie and others from the staff decided, you know, we should get everybody together online and talk this out and see what people want to do. And the boys at that meeting expressed their sadness at the girls' absence from Parson. And I talked to some of these participants. The girls encouraged the boys to resume classes even if they could not join them. They said, look, we give our blessings for this. And Makbola, one girl I talked to, said, hey, we felt respected. She recalled that day that she was part of the decision and that made all the difference. So after this meeting, the boys then opted to return to the training classes, even though the girls could not. Uh, But everybody was sort of listening to each other. And I think also Makbola said that, you know, they need this next generation of Afghan male leaders to be some who they would hope that would respect women's rights. You know, what struck me about your reporting, specifically about Parsa, is that there's something remarkable about the staying power of Marnie. (laughs) Um, You know, perhaps not of the U.S. government and their work in Afghanistan, but the staying power of Marnie and her work in Afghanistan. And I was looking back at some of your reporting on Marnie and her work uh, that he had done in the Seattle Times. And um, there's this thing that she said that really sticks with me. And this would have been back in, I believe, 2012, one of the articles you wrote then. She says, uh, the thing I have going for myself is tenure. You can't get this done if you're only here for a short period of time. They'll just try to wait you out. But we're not going away. You know, she's still doing the work. Um, And so... I was just wondering, you know, given that you've known her for these years and you're still reporting on her work, you know, how, do, how does that quote ring with you today? I mean, do, do you feel like she'd still say the same thing? I, I think you're very astute in looking at that quote and, yeah, projecting forward. I mean, she first returned uh, not too much long after 2001 for a visit. And then by, I think it was 2003 or four, she was there pretty much full time. So that's that's a long time. And I think that it's somewhat surprising to me that not only has she persevered, but she said that in some ways, these recent months, although challenging and tense, have been some of the more interesting and rewarding of her time in Afghanistan as she tries to navigate all these new political currents of the Taliban and find a way forward for Parsa. For those who have remained behind and tried to continue on to assist Afghanistan, you know, is an important story what is happening in Afghanistan. There are obviously so many crises in the world today. The war in Ukraine, the immigration and the wrenching humanitarian plight of those trying to cross the border. At the same time, this was the scene of America's longest war. We invested so much in terms of the people who went over there, the sacrifices they made, some who died, the money that was poured in, and there were lots of mistakes, and then obviously an abrupt 
collapse of the government that the U.S. backed. But we need to continue to try to understand what is happening in Afghanistan and follow stories of those still, you know, participating in, in trying to improve the country and the conditions in the country. Thanks for listening to Crosscut Reports. This episode was reported by Hal Burnton and produced by me, Sarah Bernard. The story editor was Donna Blankenship. And our executive producer is Mark Baumgarten. You can subscribe to Crosscut Reports wherever you listen. And whatever platform you're listening on, please review us. We'd love to know what you think of the show. Also, if you'd like to support the work we do at Crosscut, whether it's our lineup of podcasts, the video docu-series we stream every week, or the in-depth reporting we deliver every day, go to crosscut.com slash membership. In addition to supporting our journalism, members receive complete access to the on-demand programming of Seattle's PBS station, KCTS 9. For the latest political, environmental, and culture news from the Pacific Northwest, visit crosscut.com. That's also where you'll find a text version of the story we discussed today. Crosscut Reports is a product of Cascade Public Media. I'm Sarah Bernard. We'll be back soon with another episode. Music.